Uh, well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's an honor to uh, speak here today. Uh, Boris was the department chairman uh, when I uh, first interviewed at MIT in 1969, and he made the decision to hire me. Uh, in 1969, he had been head of the department for two years, and he was uh, transforming it from, uh, many of you aren't even old enough to know that its history was classical structural biology, Frank Schmidt, Alan Hodge, Cecil Hall. And he was bringing in, with Salve and others, the modern paradigm of information tra transfer, the central dogma. And he had fostered and mentored a bevy of microbial geneticists, Maury Fox, David Botstein, Ethan Signa, Anna Maria Toriani, and others. And he had support in this from the metabolic biochemists, Gene Brown and Jack Buchanan, who recognized the value of genetics. Uh, unlike my buddies, Frank Schmidt and Cecil Hall and Al Hodge, who did not, couldn't see, who was structural biologist, who couldn't see the value of you know, microbial genetics at the time. Anyway, my PhD was in genetics from Caltech in the days when A.H. Sturdivant and E.B. E. Lewis were on the faculty. George Beadle's memory was alive. I was thoroughly immersed in the world of genetic control of, of pathways, microbial pathways, embryonic pathways, etc. But because my PhD thesis was with Bob Edgar and Delbert on genetic control of phage morphogenesis, I had one leg in structural biology. But I knew culturally that in this world of, because I used to go to the meetings of microbial geneticists, structural biology was not greatly, they, they didn't get excited about it. Somebody said that Boris, um, Alex, he, he, that constrained him, you know, the actual s s s structures. Anyway, before going to work with, in structural biology with Aaron Klug at the MRC, I spent a year at Purdue with Sewell Champ of Benzer and Champ T4 R2 Cistron fame. And one of the leading faculty members uh, at Purdue was Fred Neidhart, who had been a student who worked with Boris uh, on pathways when, when they were at, at Harvard, on catabolite repression, on the histamine opera, uh, operon, uh, and on uh, other regulatory pathways. And I was interested in protein synthesis, so I followed their work on genetic control of amino acid bio biosynthesis, and I knew Boris's work. He, he didn't know that, um, uh, but I, I know him. Uh, so when I came to M MIT to give this seminar, which I owe Harvey Lodish, I owe credit for Harvey Lodish, because he knew that I was a microbial geneticist who was about to be a postdoc in structural biology, and I could fit, he could, you know, get a double, two for one kind, kind of. Um, so when I came to give my job seminar, I, I knew that I, it was not an audience really interested in structural biology, and I should, you know, present the kind of, this is genetic, uh, you know, it was genetic um, identification of, of morphogenic pathways, which I had done as a graduate student with Bob Edgar at Caltech. And I, I showed, these are actually two slides I showed. Uh, this is showing the, um, there are pointer. Uh, this is a mutant of a gene that makes uh, an, a protein that uh, terminates the sheath of uh, bacteriophage T4. And if it's not there, the sheath is unstable. And also the tail can't attach to the head. It's the junction uh, protein. So we had no idea what kind of protein was, but it was a genetic uh, determination. Uh, here's uh, mutants that lack the protein that makes the tail tube, and they accumulate free base plates of bacteriophage T4. So Boris, he appreciated this. I know he appreciated this because Harvey warned me, Boris always falls asleep in the middle of the seminar. And he didn't fall asleep. <laughs> and at the end of the seminar, I remember thinking, okay, I did okay, you know, because he, he didn't fall asleep. Now, I don't, in my, uh, my experience, I really can't uh, separa separate uh, Boris's role in the department with, with Salva. So these two were very close friends. I could never understand how come they were very close friends. The personalities were so different. Their styles were, were so different. So there's Salva at, uh, at, at Cold Spring Harbor, Frank Stahl, uh, Al Hershey. Um, I'm sorry, Frank Stahl's over here, uh, Watson. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Salva, mm -hmm. his history was different. Mm -hmm. Salva 
understood the importance of viruses. Uh, he came through the period of, of the polio with the epidemic and the March of Dimes. He was financed. That's how my work was, our work at Caltech was paid for by the March of Dimes, right, because of polio. And Salva understood the importance of viruses. And it was he and Delbra who took the first electron micrographs of bacteria phase T4. And he also appreciated that electron microscopes were valuable. Now, the electron microscopes were down the hall from Boris. In all the years I was at MIT, Boris never came over <laughs> to the micro. He couldn't. I, I, given what he contributed, you didn't need it. That was fine, right? He was, he was doing this, this, this other stuff. But Boris, uh, but Salva understood the thing. And so between them, between them well, I'm sure Salva had an influence. Boris offered me this job if, of, a, of joining the microbial geneticists if I would agree to run the electron microscopes, which was, which was fine with me. Though I would say it was a museum. It had the, the very first RCA electron microscope built in the United States, the very first one. Uh, built in, in Europe, and so uh, but it was. It was interesting. Now, um, at that time, a very important paradigm in structural biology was Casper and Klug, and icosahedral symmetry in viruses. And they came out of physics and mathematics. And Aaron, uh, they believed deeply that it really did self-assemble. Right? It was somehow in the structure of the universe, you know, in Euclid, the icosahedral symmetry, and that the, the, the nucleic acid condensed and the, and the virus as, assembled around it, which I, have, having studied T4, uh, wasn't, wasn't quite so sure of. So uh, Boris and Salva had recruited David Botstein and Ethan, Ethan Signa. David Botstein had followed Edgar and Edgar and isolated for P22, conditional lethal mutations in all the genes of, of P22, and the, our two groups uh, joined together in what turned out to be extraordinary productive uh, collaboration with P22, uh, which is a great, great phage and, and uh, reproduces gloriously. Uh, and we were able to identify, and here you see the value of the electron microscope, that if you looked at cells at the right time, yeah, you, you see viruses that, that condense the darknesses, the condensed DNA, which is binding urinal ion. But if you look very closely, you'll see lots of shells that don't have DNA in them and couldn't have form around the, the shells. At any rate, um, we were able to purify these, what turned out to be procapsids, and you see they have something in them. Uh, it's not DNA, and these turned out to be the precursors to making a virus. Uh, turned out uh, that Aaron and Casper, they weren't right. It didn't need help that uh, the shell was built with another protein called the scaffolding protein, but that was removed. It was absent from the mature virus. So that turned out to be the case for every double-stranded phage that was looked at, lambda and T1 and T5 and T4 and T3, et cetera. And uh, at some point, uh, we got clear that what went on is you needed these scaffolding proteins uh, to build a closed shell, and then um, the scaffolding left or was degraded, the DNA was pumped in and you got a mature uh, virus. Um, that's why lambda was the first vector, because the same thing was going on in lambda. They could package DNA in vitro because you could make a procapsid, and then you could put any gene in there and then the vector. So this aspect of the assembly pathway, now all the people who used these kits had no clue <laughs> what, 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 what was going on. I never had dealt with a student at MIT who knew that the reason the lambda works is because it builds a shell that's empty of DNA and then you put in the DNA and that's item A in the Sigma kit. But uh, <laughs> okay. now the other thing that was very important uh, was that it turned out that these shells that one of the 12 vertices had to be very special, even though it was a five-fold vertex, there was this 12-fold device called a portal, and this is the channel for the DNA going in during packaging, and then later on for the DNA coming out during in, in, in injection. So uh, to be a double-stranded DNA virus, you have a portal, and you need to build a shell. So 
Sherwood Cashins and I, he was my first postdoctoral fellow. He was Dale Kaiser's student, Chris's dad. Now, I'm a you know, contemporary of his dad. <laughs> uh, great scientist also. Uh, so we, we follow the literature. And we used to go to the, these virology me meetings and follow you know, the, the adenovirus and herpes virus literature. And we were sure that it was the same way for those vi viruses. It took 25 years before the information transfer. But finally, by the 1990s, mm. it, it, it emerged quite clearly that, for example, herpes simplex virus, cold sore virus, has a scaffolding. You make an empty shell, there's a portal. The DNA goes in through the portal, out goes the scaffolding, and you get a mature virus. And those pathways have emerged as actually targets, new targets for antiviral drugs in a few pharmaceutical industries. Uh, it also turned out, this is really just in the last few years with the high resolution cryo-electron. Um, I, I moved on from virus assembly into protein folding and other things. And the reason I moved on was because we couldn't get high resolution structures of these precursor shells. They crystallized. Every famous crystallographer would take some, get crystals, but then they couldn't get a, get a structure. And in, in the world of structural biology, you don't have a structure, you are dead, right? Um, but finally, uh, cryo-electron microscopists, most notably Wachu at Baylor, were able to get high-resolution structures. And it turned out all of the double-stranded DNA viruses, no matter what the host, herpes, T4R, archaeoviruses, P22, and more recently, we've done one of these ocean, deep ocean viruses of cyanobacteria that evolved long before terrestrial organisms. They all, their coat protein has the same fold. They all have a portal. It, we, you can explain things as saying once a billion years ago, this uh, machine evolved that had a channel and a shell, and that's, you know, dispersed everywhere. Now, uh, Boris supported uh, P22 was hot because of Salmonella typhimorium and gene transfer. T4, not so much. It was getting to be classical, but Boris was very supportive. And we went on to work out all 20 su successful genetically controlled steps in making a, a phage tail. And that ended up in the textbook as a cartoon, and that killed it dead. <laughs> <laughs> killed it dead because this completely obscures that what's happening is every structure is a reactive site that binds the next subunit, and then you generate a new reactive site. And the only place anything happens is on the growing tip of the structure. Nowadays, with amyloid polymerization, people are coming to understand it's the growing tip of the business, hunting the fibers, et cetera. Now, I want to end um, mm. with um, mm. a, uh, a, a personal thing about Boris. Uh, and like Lenny, I don't think anybody else uh, would, would say this. And I've never actually said this publicly. But I've said it privately because I always get interviewed by history of science students who are coming to hear about the, the, the regulation of recombinant DNA technology debate. So um, Lenny talked about the, that lunchroom, right? And indeed, we used to go into that lunchroom. And Gene was there first, because he, he was the, right across the, the hall, so it was e easy. Um, and, so, and, and as he said, Boris was often holding forth on some aspect of uh, Mayan and archaeology or European <laughs> literature. But Salvo would come in. That was very different. Salvo would say, we should all join the Democratic Socialists of America. <laughs> right? And Boris would smile and say, now this is a period Ethan Signer and David Baltimore are in the faculty. Ethan is soon to go to North Vietnam uh, uh, visiting the scientists. 1970, Ethan and David Baltimore lead the scientists' strike for peace. There's books written about it by historians of science that travels across the country. This is a very hot time. Maury Fox is very active in the nuclear disarmament movement. It was a different time, right? 
I never heard in all my time with Boris him ever make an openly political statement. He never joined the discussions. He just sat there in his gentlemanly fashion. But I was involved in all the stuff with Jonathan Beckwith and opposing the uh, criminal chromosome case. You know, there'd be TV people coming to MIT to, to film interviews, and then, uh, then the question of the regulation of biotechnology, many other things. Sheldon Penman, who was my close personal friend, stopped talking to me for years, right? Howard Green, years and years, would walk by in a hall, never said a word. It was a, was a you know, it was a kind of rough time. In all those years, Boris never raised an eyebrow, never was critical, just stayed as the department chairman, was supportive, um, and, and Salva. Now, at the time, I didn't quite appreciate it. And then at some point, somebody comes, some Harvard History of Science with Everett, Everett Mendelssohn, master student, comes to interview me about, well, what was it like you know, you were still on the faculty. You know, there was all this big battle going on. And then slowly I realized that Boris, in staying calm, scientific, gentlemanly, mm -hmm. he was making a statement. And then I, uh, I knew something about his history. I knew he had been in Vienna during the rise of the Nazis and be forced to leave Germany. Um, and then he went back, he was drafted and he went back to England, and he was in a hospital, military hospital facility for years dealing with casualties. Now, of course, Salva, he and Salva shared that. Salva had left Italy as an anti-fascist. And at some point, I realized, oh, Boris understands, right? He's seen, he understands the need at certain times for, you know, political action, political resistance. His style is not Salva's style, but he is going to... Uh, respect him. And, um, you know, as the years went by, uh, I will say uh, I appreciated that uh, more and more, both that the generosity of mind that he, that he had in, in appreciating, you know, these, these phage. Oh, that just shows he wasn't bothered. He just stayed cool, right? That's the only quote I could ever find from him. He's been interviewed many times. He said, well, there was this stuff going on at MIT, but it was okay, you know. <laughs> right, he stayed out of it. Uh, but the generosity of spirit, right, that he was willing to provide protection um, for those of us who were so engaged. So thanks to him and thanks to you for listening.